facing candidates with cream of the crop. We have our teacher leaders. We're not feeding them to the teachers. We're giving these teacher leaders, well, these these teachers that are coming in, teacher candidates, every opportunity we can to be successful, whether they're alternate students, whether they're a semester or a quarter, but really working closely with the universities. And I'm with SPU, with PLU, uh, our major programs, but because of the connections we have with the universities, and every university has something a little different that they offer our mentor teachers. And so me as a coordinator within the district, making sure that I have this, I have the, the information to give my teacher leaders in my system. So really, I would say reach out as a higher ed and vice versa and create a, a really successful pathway. And I think that's going to grow a lot, too, because every university has something a little bit they offer and that we are building within teaching. I will tell you every single student teacher last year got hired in my system that had done student teaching successfully. This year also I think is really a highlight is know what those hiring timelines are. So then as a university, you can say, okay, here we're helping, here's what Seattle's timelines are. And every year they're different. Right now, it's really different with this pandemic that we have, but we do have jobs. There's an internal application process first, and then there's a displace, those teachers that have been bumped. Those teachers in our district have to be certified in physical education. You just can't place anyone. It's because we have a policy. And then once they're placed, we're making sure that we're really growing the work and we're growing best practice. We see supports, we mentor them, we match them up. And then myself as an administrator, I'm making sure and I'm following up with the university supervisor or whoever it is that we're making sure they're placed in an appropriate placement. That's huge because then you're modeling, you're knowing, and you're growing within. And I would like to also, on a caveat, in diverse communities, making sure that there's all spectrum, because many of our specialists wanna go back and teach in what they know. And that's, that's really helping, I think, getting out and getting all of these experiences and seeing, just like Tracy, what he really liked. I, I agree, Lori. And I think, you know, if I can coin a phrase that forever will be used, and I just came up with it, so don't quote me, but I wish there was a category called pre-professional. We have the professional, we have the future professional. We should be recruiting high school juniors and seniors and calling them pre-professionals and organizations like Shape America and the state affiliates should start to really organize around recruiting these young people and making sure that you know teachers that have been cooperating teachers are identifying these youngsters that have this passion for working with kids and have a deliberate category in our organizations to try and help with some of these recruitment issues and call them the pre-professional and give them experiences where they can intern with a health and PE teacher and uh, perhaps visit a college. Because you're absolutely right, the traditional methods of you know college visits and brochures are now ineffective in this day and age. And, and you cannot convince a junior or a senior to go into teaching when so many barriers and obstacles will exist. One that was mentioned in the chat box was the praxis. Another is EDTPA. And, and you cannot tell me that we don't anecdotally see the evidence that EDTPA and its, its challenges have hurt recruitment in teaching. There's no doubt about it. That our kids are struggling and stressing out. Uh, for those of you who work on the university, you know this. Um, here they are getting ready to be a teacher and this intense part of their practice, <coughs> practice happens right at the end. So we've got to find ways to be able to inspire kids. And I think this category of pre-professional can really help. Yeah, I've talked to our um, local universities and our, even our um, community college about creating a pipeline. So actually we have career and technical education and you know there are programs like um, Academy of Health Sciences and they're looking at a teacher academy. So I've asked them if we can look at trying to build physical education and health education into that. We, uh, Laurie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, Greg Burt, who's a teacher, a longtime teacher in, in Washington Ooh. State and has been involved with SHAPE and, and everything, he, um, him and his partner at his high school, they have a um, future PE teachers club. And um, so that's kind of goes along with what Judy's saying as well. Like if we could partner up with some of our post-secondary opportunities and create some of those kinds of pieces, that would be a pipeline opportunity for us. 
One of the things that uh, in the track of trying to recruit uh, from the high school ranks is to be aware that sometimes when you're taking this effort, the universities financially, the students can't afford it or they don't have the prerequisites to get into those universities. So I've actually heard stories of, of professors going this route, going out to schools, and then the schools actually being mad at the university saying, yeah, come to our programs. It's going to be great. You're going to be a good fit for this. And then they get turned down on, on a lot of them get turned down and they actually just said to the university, hey, listen, you need to stop coming here. Um, our, our students aren't able to get into your university. And, you know, this is one example and it's it's usually only certain universities, right? Um, that, 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 that this might happen, but we just need to be aware that, you know, admissions is also part of it. If we're recruiting students, who are we recruiting and are they gonna be actually able to enter into our program? I was going to say there's a program right now that I am um, an adjunct faculty for. It's called the Seattle Teacher Resident Program. It's in partnership with um, the, Amer the Alliance for Education, which is a, a, a nonprofit here in Seattle. A lot of wealthy business leaders, University of Washington and Seattle Public Schools. Mind you, this is a gen ed program. Um, I teach their health and PE class. But how cool would it be to have some one pilot or something that we in this Seattle teacher resident, this is the eighth year I've taught in the program. A year before the cadre comes in, we recruit individuals that really want to teach in diverse areas. And so they have a BA, but they they're looking to get their master's in education. To make a long story short, they go through an interview process. They try and get in the program. We have people from all over the country that try and get in. They go through a year intense of student teaching. They go to class Tuesdays. Fridays and one Saturday a month. At the end of the year, they'll have their teaching certification. They're guaranteed a job for five years in the system that they taught in. And I'm thinking, how great would this be to have some pilots? And, and that's another way, a philanthropic way, but you're they're learning the system where they're teaching and their master's is paid for and they're guaranteed a job after success. And Recruiting those, um, I mean, it's it takes a lot of legwork, but just another option because our elementary people, I know there's a few science programs around the country that do this, but it's thinking outside the box. How can we really navigate and get the best people in our profession? They've got to want to be here. Obviously, they're not in for the money, but I will tell you, teachers make a lot of money here in Seattle. They max out at $132,000. Mind you, it's expensive to live here. Um, but it's really creating that mentorship and giving opportunities to grow within. Um, and that's just one of you know many ideas. So I'm gonna piggyback off of that, Lori. That was some good conversation, a great conversation from everyone. Expanding on that thought, what partners do you have in your school or in your community that you are using or that you think that we could be using to enhance this process? And anyone, please share your thoughts. I'm not sure. So go so ahead, Lori. No, you can go because I, I don't have a hook here by myself. So I'm trying to stay. So when I think about the partners that I had when I was a supervisor in my district, I, I tapped a lot into the PE teachers and health teachers who were the cooperating teachers for student teachers, right? Um, these are the teachers that are teaching their students, but also have that link to the, the Heat and Peak program uh, and understand intimately uh, what awaits a student if they go into the profession. And you've seen this before. You, re you recruit your own student to become a health and phys ed professional, and then they come back and they're in your actual, they're, they're the student teacher that you're working with. I think it's really important that link between the K-12 setting and the bridge between college and the K-12 setting. We've been trying to build that bridge for an extremely long time. And in some places it's working beautifully and in others, K-12 and college does this. And I think that there's gotta be a happy medium around the partners that we deliberately choose to help us recruit. And that starts again with the student, the junior or the senior that has a culminating experience in physical education. It's not just the last two years of their life, before they go into teaching, it's this body of work that they've said, I have enjoyed moving my body for 12 years and I love children and I'm inspired by my health and physical education teachers. And yet I understand that going into teaching is about my willingness to give of myself, my ability to, to forge relationships. It's not just about sport and athletics. 
So I think our, our most critical partners, our pivotal partners, are the teachers that have stepped in both places, that have been cooperating teachers, but have also taught in the K-12 setting. We also have to really bring HPE administrators on board. So for those colleagues of mine that remember when we did a panel discussion uh, in October one year, a couple of years back, we were constantly asked as a panel of administrators, what is it you look for in recruits? What is it you look for in good teaching? And, and Heat and Pete folks uh, were not surprised to hear us say, we want someone who's gonna love our kids at the end of the day. And so you're back to this mushy sentiment around, look, you know, I want kids to be able to be excited about building relationships and loving movement. Uh, at the same time, it's gotta be a person in the school that's tapping that student on the shoulder saying, you know, you would make a fantastic health and physical education teacher. You know why? Because that's who the student trusts the most. A guidance counselor sitting across from them from a desk saying, you know, you might be good for, you might be a great gym teacher, quote unquote. Um, that's not going to help us. They, they need to be inspired by the people closest to them. And so the, our first and foremost partner is right there, I think. Is that a mic drop? No one's going to talk now. <laughs> I think it's hard because we're in supervisory positions. So we have those connections built already and have the relationships. Um, right. So like Lori said, we could talk on it all day. Um, I've done mock interviews. It was neat to do them this year with kids who had to do them via Zoom and just figure out what space they're in. I would not want to be anyone graduating right now. Um, it's very scary. You know, they're going to get jobs and not know what their building looks like inside for some of them. Um, you know, so I've just tried to form relationships at the, you know, local universities that we have. I've done interviews everywhere, even in New York. I'm a Pennsylvanian as well. Um, so I've gone back to my university and, you know, tried to connect there. Um, just trying to build those relationships with anyone you can to find the right candidates. And it wouldn't hurt to educate guidance counselors as well. You know, I, I don't want to downplay the role of the guidance counselor in the future of the child's career. Um, but you'd be surprised how often they're not sure uh, about where the physical education opportunities are and what it means and whether or not uh, a student is fitted for that. I mean, uh, you, you can't have a kid take a survey on what career suits them and not have a conversation. So I think uh, it would really do us a, a load of good to, to connect with directors of, of guidance and to connect with guidance counselors and educate them a little bit about the new physical education. I think too, adding on to systems, creating systems and accountability. That's, the, that's huge. Whether you're in a K-12 setting, it's accountability for good teaching. It's accountability for an administrator. It's accountability. It's making what it work within a system, having that connection internally. And I'm talking K-12 with uh, human resources is, you know, we're looking at good teaching is good teaching. And I continue to say that whether you're a math teacher, science teacher, or a physical education teacher, but you need to be brought to the table. And when I say brought to the table, that you're part of that whole learning environment, depending on where that system is. Then looking at that relationship between whoever is responsible for um, K-12 teachers administratively and who's responsible for principals administratively? Because that they're the decision makers. Your site-based building community, you know, your parents are your big one of your biggest advocates. Taking that and then building that capacity with your local university. And I think when that have those university folks come in, see what's happening, and we're really finding some changes here happening. Because it, 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 yesterday is an example. We are placing a, a student teacher last year was placed and I had no idea this person had been placed within where it was. And so yesterday I had a conversation and I was um, piggybacked through the university setting and now I have the face, it's a new person and it's just building systems and then building systems because if Lori Dunn goes away in Seattle, we wanna make sure that whoever takes this spot is gonna continue to build on the systems that we're creating for best practice and lifetime and making sure that it's built capacity and that pathway is opened up. It's going to it's not going to come overnight and we've noticed over many years as Judy has said, it it takes it takes a long it's been taking a long time, but we're at a pivotal time now that I really think if we band together and we have pockets of greatness, really celebrate those pockets of greatness and replicate that. 
And that that is what I mean, we find we informally is where you learn the most. Like I'm looking on a, a lot of your faces and I haven't seen a few of you and which is I'm sorry, I haven't, but I can really learn a lot taking the research and really being able to message it in a simple way to my decision makers and say, hey, and then when we have those little successes, making sure we celebrate them in a really loud way and then, OK, it's the it's you're guilty by association. And I think that's why. When success happens, it spreads. That's a great point too, um, Lori, when you mentioned the principles. So being in my position as long as I have, I've had the ability to create that dynamic. So last year, I actually traveled to 195 of our buildings myself. Um, being the supervisor for a long time, I know all the teachers, I know the principals, I help them interview and recommend. Um, I killed myself last year, but I wanted to make sure I was able to create that connection in their building. One of my favorite situations was there's a teacher who's been in his building forever, elementary teacher, great guy. Everybody says a great guy, does a lot in the community. I sat and chatted with him and the principal. He had to go back to a class. The principal looked at me and said, help me, please help me. He is a great guy, he's this and that. She said, I read your entire curriculum myself, looked at it, shared it with him, but he's afraid of a computer and he's not doing what he needs to do. So just those little bits, you know, it, it did take a lot out of me but to communicate with principals helped a lot. And they really do understand in our school system what quality physical education looks like. I think an untapped resource too in my world is taking research that is out there, which is so very important and being able to message it uh, in a simple way, not only as an administrator, but as a, a practicing practitioner and being able to share that and saying the same thing. And however, and that I think that's where shape comes in a lot of the times, our CDC, our states, but really having the same messaging and the same uh, stairway speech is making it simple. And that's a Lori, were you done there? I could, I can talk all the time, but I'm. I would say, I would say one, one, ahead, one thing real quick. I'll jump in so Lori can go again. But um, now be one, nice. One thing I, I would say is a partnership that we we don't really utilize is parents um, going to parents because when kids go home, they need their parents to say that would be a great job for you to do, and so reaching out to parents and. Um, in our communities and letting them know what we do. And that, that means there has to be quality physical education going on so they can see that with their kids. But, but we, need to, we need kids to be going home to their families and having them saying, you should be a, you should be a teacher. Well, we are somehow 45 minutes has just cruised on by here. This has just been an unbelievable dialogue. I wish we got like a four hour time slot for this. Um, I guess the importance of this is we have to con continue this conversation. I cannot thank you enough for the panel. Thank you for the feedback and everyone else chiming in, signing in on this. Um, you know, I think we ended up with 15 and that's going to continue to grow. I think what we should have future sessions about this at every state organization. We're going to have one here in Georgia this fall collaborating with our um, university programs and schools as well too. So I encourage you, anyone involved with their state organization to have that dialogue, have a session. Someone put that in for that. Um, as well too, but the passion in this in this chat is just unbelievable. Um, this is just so exciting for me just to kind of sit here and just uh, listen as well too. And um, I think there's a lot of great things, some actual items that we can uh, get from this as well too. So um, with that, uh, Kyle, unless you have anything else to add, I just want to say thanks to everybody. This was just awesome, and we'll definitely have to do this next year, next summer, and uh, maybe maybe put together something for Shape America as well too if we want to get a panel for this as well, because it's a really critical topic and it's a really important topic uh, as well too. So, um, yeah. Thanks for setting it up, nice job. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining us and we'll just we'll upload this to YouTube and we can continue this conversation um, The unhangout will be here too. So if you have additional thoughts and questions, please add them there. So we really appreciate it everyone. Thanks Good to see you all
Yeah, stay healthy and safe. Thanks, bye. Okay, thanks guys. Appreciate it. There's you're, you're still, it's still recording, right? Yeah, it's fine. I'll edit it. Okay. Um, so, wow. so I didn't put, so there's a few things I was juggling. Sorry. I was juggling a couple things. <laughs> um,